Good morning and welcome. Welcome to the eighth national conference of ACTA. It would of course have been our ninth, but there was no conference last year because of the pandemic. And this year, though we can't meet in physical space, we can at least meet through the virtual uh, portal, which is Zoom. Our conference has a theme of synodality. Synodality renewing both the church and society. And in fact, comes from a letter addressed to the clergy of Malta by Archbishop Mario Grec, who has responsibility in the Vatican for the synodal process. The introduction of uh, synodality is going to be explored from a number of different angles. But a conference happens at a particularly important moment in the history of the church in England and Wales, and in fact, across the world. Last weekend, Pope Francis launched the synodal journey 2021 to 2023 in the Vatican and has called on bishops worldwide to launch their diocesan process this very weekend. Each of us will introduce one of the speakers today and I'm delighted to introduce and welcome to our conference, Sister Gemma Simmons. She's ideally placed to talk on the subject of synodality. I first heard her three years ago when she addressed the conference in Cardiff. And she talked then and reflected on key moments in the Acts of the Apostles and how the apostles and disciples shaped their thinking about what the church should be. And that wasn't meant to be a moment of the past. It was meant to be how church runs normally. She's a member of the Company of Jesus and they follow in Ignatian spirituality. I think she jokingly once referred to herself as a Jesuitess. And for some of her ministry, she spent a number of years in South America ministering to women and the street children. So both because of her experience in Ignatian spirituality and because of her experience in South America, she's well placed to comment on the understanding of synodality by Pope Francis, the first Jesuit Pope and the first Pope from South America. Sister Gemma will be known to most of us as a past president of the Theological Association of Great Britain, as a prolific author and writer, as a giver of retreats, and on a number of occasions, a commentator on um, ecclesiastical matters on places like Radio 4. Gives me great pleasure to welcome to our conference, Sister Chairman Simmons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and um, how lovely to see so many familiar faces in the little stamps on the screen. Um, and for those of you whose faces are not so familiar, um, how very good to be invited here. And I thank you for your hospitality. Um, Frank, Alex, anybody who's actually doing the techie stuff behind, I am going to want to share screen uh, shortly. So um, I'm just going to make sure that it's actually possible. Oh, yes, it is. How brilliant is that? Um, I think you've probably seen enough of my face to be entertained by it uh, for the moment. So I'm actually going to start up. Excellent. Um, so that you've got something rather more exciting to look at. Um, the reason why I, I think it was a wise move to ask someone to come and talk a little bit about the Ignatian spiritual and theological tradition um, and the uh, Synod is because it's important, I think, for us to understand where Pope Francis is coming from on this. It seems to me that his call for a synod is deeply and instinctively Ignatian. And therefore to understand the Ignatian tradition, I think is a help to know what it is we're being called 
to do. And of course, discernment, not only in the Ignatian tradition, because the Jesuits certainly do not have a monopoly of discernment in the church, apart from anything else. Um, Ignatius himself got a great deal of what he said um, from um, St. Francis, Francis of Assisi. And this reminds me that I intended to begin our morning actually with a prayer, a genuine prayer written by Francis of Assisi, which goes like this, most high and glorious God, give light to the darkness of our hearts, give us right faith, certain hope and perfect charity. Lord, give us insight and wisdom that we might always discern your holy and true will through Christ our Lord. Amen. So seeking wisdom is what is at the heart of discernment and it helps us to know where Ignatius thought wisdom could be found. Now, if we look at the um, biblical tradition, we'll find that there are slightly um, differing views as to how far human beings can go in seeking wisdom. The prophet Jeremiah, for instance, says the heart is devious above all else. It's perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. So the human heart devious and perverse and beyond understanding. And yet later on, uh, not only talking about the individual or the, the um, ultimately human experience, but talking about the collective experience, Jeremiah goes on to say, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt my covenant which they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach their neighbor, and each their brother or sister, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest says the Lord. So there Jeremiah seems to be balancing his sense that the human heart is not to be relied upon with a promise by God that this law of God's will actually be written on the heart. Take note of this dear friends because we're going to hear a reference to this in Ignatius himself later on. The law written on the heart. And therefore, we won't need to teach each other because we will be able to trust, says uh, Jeremiah, that from the least to the greatest, we will all, as God's people, know the Lord. So there is a sense of a trust in the collective capacity to know God and to know what is written on the heart by the Spirit. And we find something similar to this in Corinthians, where Paul is contrasting the legalism of the Pharisaic system, and he, of course, had come out of that very legalistic uh, background, to the new law, the new law of freedom given by the Holy Spirit in the crucified and risen Jesus. And so he says, you are a letter from Christ delivered by us written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So a connection with Jeremiah there. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. Our sufficiency is from God, who has qualified us to be ministers of a new covenant, not in a written code, but in the spirit, for the written code kills, but the spirit gives life. And, you know, we could spend a whole day looking at those three pieces of scripture because they all contain, in a sense, salutary warning of the capacity for human beings, both individually and collectively, for delusion, 
but they also contain hope and confidence in the capacity of human beings to respond well to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And it seems to me that that is what is written at the heart of Ignatius's exercises and constitutions, and it's also what is at the heart of Pope Francis launching this synod. Now, I believe, and I've taught for many years, that as our image of God, so our prayer and our theology. If we have an image of God as the angry dictator, God as Father Christmas, the bringer of goodies, or God the absent mathematician, this is going to um, influence the way we understand God to act through human circumstances, human history, and the development of the human mind. So here's a question. What kind of God is it that we think we are being asked to follow and who is speaking to us right now? And um, a very fine piece of theological writing and thinking done in the realms of practical theology by the theologian Helen Cameron and our own Catholic uh, Claire Watkins and various others in about 2010, um, noted that there were or there could be detected within theology four voices, as it were, four um, places from which theology emerges. So one is the normative theology, there, that is where we get our theological norms from, scripture, the creed, official church teaching, and the liturgy. This is one voice from which we derive our theology. There's also the formal the theology, the theology of the theologians, the kind of stuff I'm trying to do now, and the dialogue of theology with other disciplines like anthropology, science, um, history, um, psychology, etc. I think to me, though, most interesting in, uh, for our purposes is to, um, for us to be clear about the difference between espoused theology, that is, what we say we believe, and any group, a religious order or a, a church or a, a society of some sort of group within the church, actually articulates its belief. <clears throat> but very often the espoused theology finds itself at considerable odds with the operant theology. That is the theology that's embedded in the actual practice of a group. And this is where we have our greatest problem. And I think this is what Pope Francis is trying to <coughs> get us to work on. Because we have a very fine theology articulated extremely um, elegantly in all sorts of documents, official documents, in things that we say out loud in church. And yet, the utter, utter, devastating tragedy of the sexual abuse crisis in the church, across the church, wherever the church finds itself, makes quite clear that there can sometimes be an utter abyss, a complete gulf between the church's articulation of its belief and the actual practice within the group. And the fact that Pope Francis has weighed in so heavily during his papacy about the evils of clericalism, a clericalism which is a two-way street between a clergy that insists on seeing itself as a privileged and protected type of human person and a laity which so often allows itself permits itself to be infantilized so that it doesn't actually have to take responsibility for what's going on in the church. Uh, the fact that Pope Francis has, has fought and is fighting so hard against this and is fighting uh, a, a battle where he's constantly on the back foot because of the recalcitrance of his own clergy worldwide, this tells us about the serious difference there is between espoused and operant theology. And again, that's a thought I want us to keep in our heads if we can during this day. 
So we know the story. I think most of you probably know the story of Ignatius. This year is the year of the cannonball. It's being celebrated in Ignatian circles as the year in which um, Ignatius had his legs smashed by a cannonball during the siege of Pamplona. And that was the huge catalyst to a change in his life, a change from being a young man about town who fancied himself as a knight in shining armor doing deeds of daring do and turned him into someone who voluntarily and enthusiastically embraced poverty and embraced the life of a pilgrim in order to go through the world uh, seeking to serve God and find God in all things. And here's uh, a picture of him lying in the castle of uh, Loyola trying to recover from the grisly operations that he had on his leg and actually learning to discern, learning to tell the difference for the first time in his life between the way some feelings led him and the way other feelings led him, the way his imagination could be used in prayer, the way his desires operated as a means of understanding the way the Holy Spirit worked within his life. And we find elements of this in the constitutions, the rule of life of the Jesuits and many other um, religious congregations. I saw uh, to my delight, the face of Helen Bamba peeping out from a little square. And Helen, of course, like me, belongs to a female religious congregation, which takes the Ignatian constitutions as its own rule of life in one way or the other. And in the preamble to the constitutions, Ignatius says this, although it must be the supreme wisdom and goodness of God, our creator and Lord, which will preserve, direct and carry forward in his divine service, this least, sorry, I didn't mean least, um, I am going to actually, because that's going to hugely confuse everybody. Uh, I uh, tend to write these days sorry about that, with uh, dictation because of a problem with my arm, and sometimes it doesn't understand what I'm saying. Okay, uh, direct, preserve, direct, and carry forward in his divine service this least society of Jesus, just as he deigned to begin it. And although what helps most in our own heart towards this end must be more than any exterior constitution, the interior law of love and charity, which the Holy Spirit writes and engraves upon hearts. Nevertheless, since the gentle arrangement of divine providence requires cooperation from his creatures, he goes on to say, we are going to write these rules to help you. We're going to use our minds. We're going to use the authority of the church. We're going to use the teaching of scripture and the teachings of the church to decide how we will live our lives as members of this least society of Jesus. So he talks about this interior law of charity and love, which the Holy Spirit writes and engraves upon hearts, what he later on calls in Latin, discreta caritas. And it seems to me this belief that the Holy Spirit does write and engrave the interior law of charity and love on our hearts, that is at the heart of what Pope Francis is doing in putting his trust in the people of God to actually carry the church forward and take it into a new uh, way of thinking and acting. So Ignatius wrote his spiritual exercises to help us to rid ourselves of disordered attachments, as he calls them, practices or beliefs or ideas that hold us captive. The aim is to help us act freely in the world as transformed transformers, being the loving eyes, ears, hands and hearts of Christ to a wounded world. And we have heard this in Pope Francis's writings, where he talks about us touching the suffering flesh of Christ in others. So the aim of discernment is to allow God's spirit to lead us daily so that we can develop an instinct for where God is present and active. That's its purpose. And both Ignatius himself and clearly Francis and clearly the Second Vatican Council are convinced 
that what is going on in the world is not separate from what is going on in the church, that the spirit is at work in the world and the church's job is to try and discern that spirit and try and articulate what the spirit is saying. So we have in Gaudium et Spes, the joys and hopes, the grief and anguish of the people of our time, especially of those who are poor or afflicted, are the joys and hopes, the grief and anguish of the followers of Christ as well. Nothing that is genuinely human fails to find an echo in their hearts. Nothing that is genuinely human. And I find to my despair, sometimes if you read the Catholic blogosphere, I try not to because it's like swimming in a septic tank. But if you go into the Catholic blogosphere, there is such an articulation of fear and anger and rejection of what is genuinely human as seen as being secular and totally set against the sacred and the holy. And it seems to me that this is an utterly, utterly Gnostic view of the world that, you know, we, we should have done away with centuries ago when Gnosticism was declared to be um, not consistent with Christian revelation. But uh, we, we keep separating the secular and the sacred or trying to do so. And this call to the synod is both a deeply Ignatian and a deeply ecclesial and a deeply Christian theological call to believe that the Holy Spirit is at work in the movements within the world. So embedded in the Ignatian exercises and constitutions is the belief that the Holy Spirit speaks to us in practical circumstances, in the signs of the times and in the depths of our hearts. Ignatius does teach caution in the face of the human capacity for self-deception, as the prophet Jeremiah does, but also he teaches confidence in the spirit's power to guide and in our power to allow ourselves correctly to be guided. In Let Us Dream, Pope Francis says, COVID has unmasked the other pandemic, the virus of indifference, which is the result of constantly looking away, telling ourselves that because there's no immediate or magic solution, it's better not to feel anything. The, this crisis unmasks our vulnerability, exposes the false securities on which we had based our lives. And if COVID has done a lot of unmasking, then to go back again to a previous point I made, the sexual abuse crisis has massively unmasked the virus, not only of indifference, but of the abuse of power that is endemic throughout our church and throughout all our structures. Um, I speak as someone who has read very carefully the recent report from France, and it is totally devastating. It's totally devastating be precisely because it doesn't just come from somewhere else. There are such familiar aspects of this in aspects of our own um, collusion with this, our own refusal to see what's in front of our eyes, our inability and I count myself in this, our inability to understand or to accept, because it's so unthinkable, what has been going on for so long before our very eyes. So people tend to think of, of uh, the Ignatian orders, the Jesuits particularly, as experts in obedience. But if we take the Latin word obedience, uh, ob audire, it means to listen attentively. So obedience is above all, if we want an obedient church, we must have a listening church, a church that has its ears wide open to the signs of the times and what is going on within the world. And if we look at the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, we'll see that discernment is not for lone rangers. It's never a one man, one woman band. It's always done in companionship with Jesus and with the faith community, both in the community's entirety and in its individual members. Our feeling and faith responses help us to recognize Jesus, our daily companion in the scriptures, 
in our lived experience and in the breaking of bread. And so that story of Emmaus, in that story, Jesus gets the disciples to reflect on their lived experience in the light of scripture and reflect on scripture in the light of lived experience. And that's what discernment is. And that's what we're being asked to do now, not to try and make laws which are completely uh, distinct from human experience, but to test the laws and to test the spirit in the light not only of scripture and church teaching, but in the light of reality and the lived experience of the vast majority of people who are in the church. So discernment is what we see people like Jacob wrestling with the angel. We see people doing within the biblical narratives. Mary, how can this be? My son, why have you done this? Joseph, trying to make sense of his dreams, finding clarity through trust and risk taking, freedom through letting go of regret for the past or anxiety about the future, and moving forward without certainty. I would go as far to say that a church that is certain is pretty much always likely to be a church that is wrong. In discerning any question, especially those most fundamental to our lives, some key points may help to clarify where and by what inner paths we're being led. So I'm gonna do a very, very swift rush through some of the key points of discernment. Now, we have said that the scriptures are a guide, but we also know that the scriptures are subject to our understanding. I give, for instance, one which has held very long and continues to hold in many church circles, the prohibition in Leviticus against um, same-sex relationships. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is on them. Pretty um, straightforward uh, teaching there. And many of the churches have held on to this. Indeed, the law of the land held on to this for a very long time. But in the same book of Leviticus, just prior to this, keep my decrees, do not mate different kinds of animals, do not plant your field with two kinds of seed, do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. Well, you know, this is also a prohibition, which most of us are quite cheerful to live with and ignore. I imagine that most of us, if we look at the labels in our clothes today, we'll find that we are wearing clothing woven of two kinds of material. And any of you who are um, the proud companions of a labradoodle or a cockapoo will have mated different kinds of animals. Why is it that we are perfectly well willing to rough, ride roughshod over Leviticus 19, but still find ourselves bound by Leviticus 20. We are asked to make understandings, to make um, discernments and deliberations of different kinds of, of scriptural teaching and of church teaching. And I just look at something that comes out on this topic from Amoris Laetitia. The configuration of our own mode of being, whether as male or female, is not simply the result of biological or genetic factors, but of multiple elements having to do with temperament, family history, culture, experience, education, the influence of friends, family members and respected persons, as well as other formative situations. It's true that we cannot separate the masculine and the feminine from God's work of creation, which is prior to all our decisions and experiences and where biological elements exist which are impossible to ignore. But it's also true that masculinity and femininity are not rigid categories. Well, that's a long way away from Leviticus, isn't it? A rigid approach turns into an over-accentuation of the masculine or feminine and doesn't help children and young people to appreciate the genuine reciprocity incarnate in the real conditions of matrimony. Such rigidity in turn can hinder the development of an individual's abilities to the point of leading him or her to think, for example, that it's not really masculine to cultivate art or dance or not very feminine to exercise leadership. This, thank God, has changed. 
but in some places, deficient notice notions still condition the legitimate freedom and hamper the authentic development of children's specific identity and potential. And I added the italics there. Here is Pope Francis writing in full flood, trying to talk about something that most people see as utterly essential to our understanding of the human condition, namely gender, a very, very vexed issue in today's world. And yet, what he's trying to do is get us to think about the context, the genuine reciprocity the deficient notions which we can bring to our understanding of things when we are trying to discern. That's just one concrete example. So in discernment, desires matter. And it can be deeply unhelpful, according to Ignatius, to place desires into hierarchies or categories of right or wrong outside any context of pastoral or experience and theological analysis. Equally, we need honesty and clarity to see what's really driving us. And here speaks Saint Augustine, the patron saint of desire after all, who says the whole life of a good Christian is holy desire. What you desire you cannot see yet, but the desire gives you the capacity so that when it does happen that you see, you may be fulfilled. This is our life, says Augustine, to be exercised by desire. So what are we doing in discerning? We're asking the church as a whole to look at what are not only our deep desires as a faith community, but the deep desires and aspirations of our world and everyone in it. Questions matter. What lies at the heart of our questions and of our convictions? What lies behind our determination that this is how it has to be? What mental models are we operating out of? Are we indeed, as uh, Amoris Laetitia suggested, imprisoned by historical categories whose change of context now demands new responses? Is there something that prevents us from being clear about our questions? perhaps because we are operating out of mental models that no longer hold in the modern world. And what's the reality of our context and how does that impact on the choices we make? Can we trust God to lead us? Can we trust ourselves? Do we reserve judgment to one category of person alone, namely the clergy, ignoring the capacity of others to judge and participate. Well, if we do, we are going against the clear teaching of the Second Vatican Council, which taught that the whole people of God has the capacity to discern the Holy Spirit. Memories, says Ignatius, are not neutral. I have as a picture, the picture of Jesus's own family tree, which was as full of skeletons as it could possibly hold. But the collective memory, even of people who are failures, people like King David with his harp there, an adulterer and a murderer, um, above him, Solomon, who, who lost all his wisdom in pursuit of wine, women and song. Can even fragile persons as ourselves hold memory as something that helps us to make decisions for now? And can the memory of our deepest encounters with God help to reconnect us with what lies at the root of our heart's desire and our most authentic self? Are there memories in our collective history that bind us or free us to see, judge and act in particular ways? The zeitgeist can, of course, be a collective delusion, and I have to say, I read occasionally the um, summer, the Sunday supplements in newspapers with a, 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 a gathering sense of anguish and disbelief as we keep being promised that the more we consume, the happier we will be. And that's a sign of the times, if ever there is one. But it can also be a sign of a collective instinct that new times and circumstances require new perspectives. 
if we recognize a pattern of orientation towards a particular choice that won't let go, it's worth exploring it as potentially the guiding light of the spirit. And it's worth taking our dreams, not only our actual dreams in sleep, but our dreams as people and the dreams of people for freedom, for a better life, to take those seriously and feed them into our discernment. Ignatius tells us that our bodies are a source of God's re revelation, powerful carriers of wisdom, our embodied selves acting in the world in all that we do. And if that's true, then our embodiment has to be a serious element in discernment, and that includes people who are perceived <coughs> in some way to be differently bodied whether because they are of the female persuasion in a church that has largely reserved decision-making to men, or whether they are people who are same-sex attracted, whether they are people who are in some way deemed to be disabled, but who often have an extraordinary wisdom to offer the rest. And so with rules and laws set down in the past, it's worth considering how the body was seen at that time, how the body's relationship to the mind and soul was understood, and whether that body was seen to be general for all, or whether the thought and the ideas of the human body were predicated, indeed as they were in much theology and philosophy, on the masculine body exclusively. Ignatius tells us that reason and imagination are different faculties of our mind, which help us to get in touch with responses to God's grace. And in that sense, imaginative contemplation and prayer in the gospel plays a major role in helping us to um, come to an understanding of our deepest desires where the spirit is at work. And so throughout this synod, what Pope Francis is absolutely not doing is inviting us to a talking shop. He is inviting us to a shop where we share our thoughts and ideas, but also where we pray together and allow the spirit to do its work and allow the word of God to do its work on our minds and hearts, as well as using our rational faculties to make choices and decisions, sifting the data and balancing reasons for and against a decision. And finally, where do we get confirmation for what we think, the way we think we must go forward? Well, there are practical exercises Ignatius suggests about listing reasons for and against a particular choice using our rational capacity, but also finding confirmation in scripture, doctrine, moral teaching, and within the faith community, testing the spirit against the signs of the times. And our options basically are either to refuse to change because that's too scary, or to redefine our understanding of who and what we are as individuals and a faith community, or to mature into a more whole and integrated way of living together and with the rest of life on earth, opening ourselves to a more expansive and inclusive vision for ourselves and the world and growing the way we see and feel about everything to perceive differently so that we can begin to act differently. And that is the humility of this road that we are asking the spirit to help us to perceive differently in order to help us to act differently. And here is a rather robust um, piece of American, Americanism to help us to see what I mean by perceiving differently. Edgar Mitchell, the Apollo 14 astronaut, talked of what it was like the first time that he saw the Earth from a different perspective, the perspective of the moon. You develop an instant global consciousness, he said, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world and a compulsion to do something about it. From out there on the moon, international politics looks so petty. You want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck and drag him a quarter of a million miles out and say, look at that, you son of a bitch. Now, 
I wouldn't suggest that we do that with the Pope or indeed with any of our bishops or our clergy. Um, this is not the way forward. But thank God for that. <laughs> indeed, quite so. <laughs> but if we are looking to have our perceptions changed, if we're asking the Holy Spirit to help us to see with the Spirit's eye, understand with the Spirit's heart, and act with the Spirit's wisdom, then it may well be that what we develop, and it seems to me that Pope Francis is urging us this in all of his teaching, to have a people orientation, a dissatisfaction with the state of the world, a compulsion to do something about it. And the ability to discern between what is essential and what is petty. And because I've been talking about Pope Francis so much, I thought I might bring Pope Benedict into the picture for a moment in his very splendid encyclical space, Salvi. Christianity wasn't only good news, the communication of a hitherto unknown content. The Christian message was not only informative, but performative. That means the gospel isn't merely a communication of things that can be known. It's one that makes things happen and is life-changing. The dark door of time of the future has been thrown open. The one who has hope lives differently. And if that is true, it seems to me that the one who is open to a synodal way of taking the church forward is actually taking the Christian message into something that ceases to be largely informative and sees itself as essentially performative. I want to move, but somehow, for its own reasons, my computer, yes, thank you very much. I want to finish, therefore, with a prayer that comes from Pope Francis and a reminder that what we are being asked to do is to look at our world and to discern what is going on in our world through the power of the Holy Spirit. And maybe in your muted silence, you would like to say this prayer together with me. Lord, Father of our human family, you created all human beings equal in dignity. Pour forth into our hearts a fraternal spirit and inspire in us a dream of renewed encounter dialogue, justice and peace. Move us to create healthier societies in a more dignified world, a world without hunger, poverty, violence and war. May our hearts be open to all the peoples and nations of the earth. May we recognize the goodness and beauty that you have sown in each of us and thus forge bonds of unity, common projects and shared dreams. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, that was really a very whistle-stop tour, but I hope it gives us a background of understanding the framework in which I think we are being invited by Pope Francis to think and act collegially, think and act in a synodal fashion that reads the signs of the times, that places our theological perspectives and thoughts that places the teachings of the church in direct dialogue with what is going on in the world and with the context of our time. Um, this is the moment for us to be brave. It's also the moment for us to be humble. And above all, it seems to me, it is the moment for us to realize that the model on which we have been operating for so long does not work and has been working to the destruction of many good people in the abuse of power structures within the model. We have to find a way of thinking differently. We have to find a way of communicating differently. And above all, we have to find a way of acting differently if we are to do God's will in the time that is given to us in our lives. Thank you very much. Just Gemma, thank you very much indeed. That was a very comprehensive, that was everything that we hoped it would be. Thank you very much. The programme sets out that there will be some 10, 15 minutes for questions and answers. And I know some questions have come in on the chat facility. So I'll now hand over to Alex, 
who will give us the first, maybe first couple of questions uh, uh, and who, who, who has said them. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Gemma. The, the phrase that um, sprang out for me when you said a church that's always certain is probably a church that is wrong. Um, and I think that's something that we can reflect on today. The, 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 the question here comes from Birmingham Actor, which says, how can we ensure this synodal process becomes a long-term and permanent way of the church, of being church, sorry. I think I, I would want to say one thing, which is to stop hanging around waiting until we've got permission. You know, whose permission do we need to do this? Um, the facts speak for themselves, dear friends. Um, you know, I, I'm working at the moment with a diocese that is sorting out its shortage of priests by importing people in from the global south. Uh, very often whose own uh, education and culture is deeply at variance with the education and culture of the people whom they're called to serve. Um, you know, that is one way of dealing with things, but it's not going to serve us completely in the long run, it seems to me, because that that is about operating one model only of what it means to have a, a faith community um, working together. It seems to me that we really have got to invite one another to be grown up. Um, and uh, I don't mean a kind of people's revolution against the bishops. I mean, you know, ideally, this is about pastors and people working together in support of one another. Um, and, and in mutual respect of one another. But I think we just have to stop waiting for permission and get on with it if I may say so robustly. <laughs> uh, Maddie asked the question, can the church learn from the huge changes in pedagogical methods over the last 50 years to make teaching more student-centered? You bet. And I think this is something, you know, maybe we need to ask ourselves in our schools. And, you know, I work a lot with Catholic heads and Catholic schools and my days they are doing their level best, you know, but also in our catechesis. You know, let's look at this and ask ourselves, in what way are we actually, um, you know, dialoguing with our young people? And, uh, you know, children have extraordinary levels of wisdom. It's worth asking them and it's worth taking their experience seriously. You know? Yeah, thank you. Um, David asked the question, and it always comes up whenever we're, you know, discussing with each other, is a male-only clergy reinforces the dangerous notion that only men should hold positions of power and that women are, and are the less powerful, should be subject to that power. Um, and the early church seemed to be at ease with both men and women in leadership roles, particularly with the clergy's recent history regarding paedophilia, predominantly perpetrated by males, there must be the very least be a need to carefully review whether a male priesthood is best for the people of God. Amen. Amen. I mean, I don't know if any of you, many of you are familiar with the work of Phyllis Zagano, who writes a great deal about um, the female diaconate. Now, she has been careful to skirt around the issue of women's priesthood, I think because she's trying to get an audience at least from those who might be willing to hear at that level. But it, she does argue extremely persuasively for a female diaconate. Um, I don't know what any of the rest of you think about this. Uh, I mean, my perception is that Pope Francis is not enthusiastic, be not because he's not enthusiastic about women, but he's not enthusiastic about clericalizing another section of the church giving that clericalization is already a huge problem. And yet many women are saying, yes, but. Mm. If this is the only way to get female leadership um, operating <coughs> normative in the church, and there are historical precedents for it, why not? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, Tony asked the question about um, 
if we need to be aware of how far removed from Pope Francis and the laity some of the bishops are, uh, if we take, for example, um, a look at the pastoral letter that was issued by the Bishop of Shrewsbury on the Synod, all it concentrates is on the Mass and Exposition. What can I say? What can I say? Um, you know, the bishop is the servant of the church. The bishop is not the church itself. And, you know, bishops are subject to the need for conversion, just as the rest of us are, daily. Um, I would have a different view, personally, had I written that letter. I think that's all I can say in charity. I'm sure you um, have the ears to hear. Yes, indeed. Um, Frank asks, how do we capture the lived experience of the laity? Oh, wow. I mean, I think we're doing it, you know, by, by, by sharing and by making this. I mean, I'm, I'm massively impressed. Uh, my, my niece got married some 10, 11 years ago to a delightful young man who hasn't an ounce of faith of any sort whatsoever, although he's a good-hearted fellow and um, relatively sensible. And um, their parish priest actually asked the two of them as a couple to be part of the marriage preparation team. And, you know, originally my niece fell about laughing and said, well, you know, I don't see what he's got to tell anybody. Um, but actually the parish priest said, yes, but so many of the people I'm being asked to marry now are marrying somebody who has no faith. So I think it's really important that we have somebody here who is able to talk to such couples about what it's like being part of a Catholic marriage when you have no faith at all. You know, why don't we listen to that voice? And it seems to me that that was a really, a truly pastoral instinct to say, you know, we need not be afraid of voices that are not entirely in tune with, with those coming from within the church, that dialogue is an essential part of growth. So I, I would, I would have this in, in all our parishes, in all our pastoral programs. It is, of course, why I would love there to be more preaching um, by the laity. Because I think it would be very interesting for the people of God to hear the word of God expounded upon by people who have a very different kind of lived experience. Yeah, very true. Thank you. Last question, Gemma, um, from... from David, um, it's, it's probably an easy answer, but is compulsory celibacy for priests a sign that we don't take the body seriously? Utterly and completely, yes. Thank Spoken you. Spoken by a lifelong <laughs> celibate. <laughs> but a celibate by choice, it seems to me actually, uh, you know, I know what are the spiritual and theological ideas behind compulsory celibacy and behind the ideal of celibacy and indeed you know I've tried to live it myself all my adult life but celibacy is a gift it's a charism to enforce it as the condition of priesthood seems to me to rank under cruel and unusual punishment and what it does tragically is it sets up situations where the whole of the clergy is embedded in a culture of secrets and lies and shame. And I know some wonderful, wonderful priests who have lived lives of unimpeachable celibacy since they were ordained often with great struggles, but with enormous integrity, and I hugely, hugely admire them. But I've also known excellent priests who have simply found it impossible to do this. And we are losing a remarkable resource. And I think most of us know clergy in other Christian traditions who are married and who have every bit of the same sense of dedication and self-giving 
that um, their celibate brethren in the Catholic Church have. I, it, I, and the, the situation we have now where, in fact, we have a de facto married priesthood anyway, because we accept into the Catholic priesthood men who have previously been Anglican priests and, and married. It, it just makes a nonsense of this. And it seems to me, uh, I think it's abusive and I, I think it must go. I really, um, I've become increasingly convinced of this. Um, I, I would very much like it to be something that we, we see in all of our lifetimes. The priesthood liberated from a notion that seems to me unhelpful to say the least. Thank you very much, Sister Gemma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you, Sister Gemma. Um, I am doing, according to the programme, I'm doing the vote of thanks at the very end of the day. I'm conscious that because of other commitments on your time, you might not be with us. So I can't let this moment pass without thanking you most um, gratefully for what was a, a superb presentation. It really did do all the things that we ever hoped that it would. And I know that you have given us a great deal of thought for what is coming next, which are workshops. Um, there are two questions which Sister Gemma has set. I'll bring those up on the screen now for you. How can we improve the understanding of laity and clergy regarding the issue of synodality? And secondly, what are the characteristics of a listening church? In a moment, you'll be moving into workshops. The workshop